All right, hi, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, we're going to talk about Jamaica now. Jamaica uh, is a small island. It's a tiny island of a population that hasn't reached three million yet. And yet, Jamaica's sense of its own largeness is <laughs> kind of incredible. Uh, on the on the eve of our independence, uh, who you could call a kind of de facto poet laureate of Jamaica, Louise Bennett, she writes, and I will half translate from the Creole so you understand. She writes, she hoped she, said, she hoped the, the caution world map to stop drawing Jamaica small because that little speck can't show our independentness at all. And more so ever, we must tell map that we don't like our position. Kindly take us out of the sea and put us in the ocean. Hmm. <laughs> uh, 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 this... <laughs> That sense of Jamaica's largeness is, I mean, both kind of humorous and uh, problematic at the same time. In, uh, in Jamaica's imagination, Jamaica is a country and everyone else in the Caribbean is from a small island. <laughs> You're either from Jamaica or you are from a small island. Yeah. <laughs> even those who are from, even Guyana, which is neither small nor an island, is in the Jamaican imagination a small island. Uh, <laughs> And so, you know, I, I put out that disclaimer because uh, there's, there's both a privilege and a danger in a focus on Jamaican literature. Um, the, the very thing that this conference is guarding against, that sense of isolation and exceptionalism is something that Jamaicans, I think, are given to. Um, Elizabeth uh, Walcott, when she was speaking yes yesterday, she spoke very well about uh, a sense of unity that we had across the Caribbean that was... Uh, that could be centered in the fact that we had uh, a cricket team. But there are really three things that we've had in the Caribbean and that we still have. Um, we have a cricket team, we have a university, and we have a literature. And those are things that we have to safeguard, uh, that we've never thought of Jamaican literature as an entity in and of, in and of itself. It's always mm -hmm. been part of something uh, yeah, bigger, and we've always shared that heritage. All the great writers are equally or forefathers, well, except Naipaul, Trinidad, you can have Naipaul. Uh, <laughs> uh, I guess the, the small other disclaimer I should say before we get into this discussion, or just something I should point out, however, uh, where that is. I think this, the setup of this panel almost beautifully and in a magical way reflects something else about the literature that's being created, meaning there are three of us, uh, Jamaican writers, and we'll be, we'll be talking to each other. Um, and there is the fact of an audience listening to that conversation. And I, I'm always mindful of how that audience shapes um, what you say and what you mm -hmm. don't say. Uh, and because that is the fact of the literature that we're writing when we're being published in America, published in the UK. Mm -hmm. We are writing a Jamaican literature that's being overheard. Uh, Dion Brand, who I'm obsessed with, a Trinidadian writer, once began a conversation in a setting very much like this, and she said something, again, that might be uncomfortable. She said, that I am a black woman addressing a white audience is part of the present text because race mediates all of our exchanges. It means, it, uh, whether political, personal, it means there are some things I'm about to tell you and some things that I can't tell you. And the most important things are the things I can't tell you. Uh, mm. I say that to allow us, mm -hmm. if it ever comes up, to say the important things, yeah. okay. um, to be conscious of that, but to, to, to risk it and to say it and to uh, allow the audience to uh, be part of it and uh, not mm -hmm. to censor. Anyway, I yeah. thought we could start by, by the way, I'm Kai Miller. <laughs> yes. Hi. Uh, this is Nicole Dennis Ben, and uh, you know you don't need to know him. Uh, that's Marlon James. Uh, so I thought we could start by well, you know, this was a request yesterday to punctuate the conversation with some readings and mm -hmm. to give a sense of the work. So I've asked uh, my fellow panelists to read something very short, just to e evoke a sense of Jamaica uh, before we begin talking about that landscape and that place and that language. Uh, so should we start from? 
start end and come around. Yeah, I, um, I'm going to read a section of a Jamaican watching an American <clears throat> watch Jamaica. <laughs> His name is Josie Wales, and he's watching the new head of this, the new the new executive director of the CIA taken in Jamaica. But this was 1978, and I'd done with 1978. When the old American leave for Argentina in January, a new one come and take the spot. New American songs, same old lyrics. He called himself Mr. Clark. Just that, Mr. Clark. Clark, just ditch the E. He think it was so funny, he said every time we meet up, Clark, just ditch the E. He already know Dr. Love, but it seemed every American who walk around in Kingston in a sweaty white shirt and a tie open know Louis Hernan Rodrigo de las Casas. April 1978, and we're at Morgan's Harbor, the hotel for white people over in Port Royal. We're looking over at Kingston from the almost empty restaurant. Well, they were looking, I was watching. Me with two foreigner who already feel the pirate spirit taking them over from head to cock. It's a thing to watch the kind of feeling that take up a white man every time you take him to Port Royal. You wonder if this is the same spirit that leap up in them as soon as they land on any rock. I'm betting it's so, from as far back as Columbus and slavery. Something about landing from sea that make a white man feel free to say and do as he please. Did Blackbeard ever pillage and plunder these parts, matey? <laughs> Me only know Henry Morgan, sir. Also in Jamaica, Matey's a woman at a man keep that is not him wife. <laughs> oh, oops. It's a long time since I chat bad on purpose. <laughs> Someone saw that Dr. Love had to translate two times. And this one wasn't like Louis Johnson, holding that memo upside down, pretending to show white people that nigger can't read. Something I still remember. But then he say, you poor precious people. You don't even know that you're on the very verge of anarchy. Mm. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> wow. All right. Good morning. Again, thanks for having us here in this panel. I'm going to read from a, it was a very short excerpt from Here Comes the Sun. Um, Dolores comes close to Tandy, her arms open as if to embrace her. Tandy's prepared to rest her head against her mother's big breasts. She's ready to drop her shoulders and let her mother rub them. Tell her that it will be all right, that Clover got what he deserved. The embrace is a sweet one, one Tandy has forgotten until now. Her mother's love is as vicious and domineering as her personality. Once it's felt, there's none other like it. Tandy relaxes in Dolores' embrace, allowing herself to be rocked back and forth like a baby. But then it's cut short. Slowly, Dolores pries Tandy off her and holds her at arm's length. I want you to come to your senses and turn that boy in. Everything I'm for a reason and that was it, Dolores says. Do it for all of it, Andy. He was defending me. The devil is a liar. Him kick you down, but it don't mean say so he can't get back up and use the tool him fling give you. What Clover did is history. Something long gone. So put it behind you and do the right thing. Him is a brute mama, shh. You won't pay for cursing the dead. Dolores pulls Tandy closer again and rocks her in her bosom. She smells like the green banana she sliced up. She runs her fingers through Tandy's hair as she speaks. You and that boy, Charles, shouldn't mix in the first place. As I say, if you go pick up with a street boy, then you must at least get something out of it. Forget about what Clover did. That won't set you free. It's enough woman it happened to, and it didn't kill them. What will set you free is money. Don't someone ever teach you that. I send you to good school for good reasons, yes? But it's also for you to learn common sense. You think because Charles same love you, that you worth something? You think because him say him want you, that he mean it? That is not wanting him after and when him get it, him run? What is this lovey? Eh? You don't know nothing about no love. Love is foolish. You ever see love put running water in a pipe? You ever see love build a roof over your head? You ever see love give you free education, especially to those children whose parents can't afford school fee? You ever see love full up with cupboard? You ever see love how we visa so we can get anywhere far from this rat hole? What can love do for you? How you gonna love a stranger when you don't even know what love is? He will just take advantage of you and walk away. You have to get your return in dollars, not cents. And besides, who gonna want a naive girl like you? But suppose him did really want you. Could you really love somebody who is an absolute fool when it come out to these things? Somebody who green? 
You wouldn't want that, and neither would he. You're giving him everything for free. Boys like trippy girls like that. They take one look at your black face. I know you're desperate enough to spread your legs at the first compliment. They see your true color before you tell them your name. They know they can't tell you anything, and your black self believe it and accept it. How we so used to getting the leftovers? Who you know really love a black girl for more than what's between our legs? You're a pretty black girl, but it's my duty as a mother to teach you these things. Put something in your head, child. You know how much money we could have get? 10,000 US dollars. That can take you from here to eternity. Pay for your education and everything. Use your head, child. You can't place more value on this boy and his foolish love over money. If it means a little to you, then you lose everything. Remember this, nobody love a black girl, not even ourself. Now get up and get your pay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I thought I'd change my reading because Marlon. <laughs> no. Oh gosh. No, Marlon evoked Columbus. <laughs> which, why not? Let's go there. Uh, I'll, the, we are all novelists on this panel, but I, at least I can move to poetry when I pretend I'm not a novelist. So <laughs> I'll, I'll read for you a poem. There's a series of poems in this collection where I, I'm trying to evoke Jamaica by different places and by different place names because I think mm. place names say a lot. So I'll read a place name poem. Uh, this, I, I keep on telling everyone this, the, I wrote this because of a weird thing as the queen took out all her gold in Buckingham Palace once and they invited a poet to write a poem about this display of gold. I don't know why they asked me. That's rather <laughs> stupid, what, right? I mean, they know what they're gonna get. Uh, <clears throat> So anyway, uh, so I, I wrote this for, for that occasion. Uh, place name, Oracabeso. Origins disputed, but most likely leave over from the Spanish, Oracabeza, golden head. Though what gold was here, other than light glinting off the bay, other than bananas bursting out from red flowers, though this too is disputed, not the flowers, but the origin of bananas. They may have come here with Columbus on a ship which in 1502 slipped into Oracabessa the way grief sometimes slips into a room. In those days, the sailor tried to name the island Santa Maria as if not knowing we already had a name in another language, a language whose speakers would soon all die, though this too is disputed, not the deaths, but the completeness of genocide. For consider, if you will, such leave over words as hurricane, hmm. consider barbecue, consider Jamaica, land of wood and water, of wood and water, but not of gold. Could someone please go back in time and tell Columbus in Taino there is no word for gold? Christopher Columbus, in Italiano Cristoforo Colombo, in Espanol Cristobal Colón. A teacher once told me Colón is root word for colonist, and though I know that was false etymology, there is some truth to it. A rock of Bessa, at which place you might find such tranquil villas as Golden Ridge, Golden Cloud, Golden Eye, long time home of Ian Fleming, who sat there on Cliff's Edge, the morning's breakfast brought to him by a woman named Doris, the scent of ackee and crisp fried breadfruit wafting up to his nostrils while between his teeth he bit a number two pencil, all the time looking out to sea as if fishing for a story, maybe a man. An incredible man, let's call him Bond. <laughs> James Bond, who knew 007 wasn't actually Scottish, but a barefoot boy from St. Mary, Jamaica. Like so many others, he too migrated the brutish winter, cooling his complexion down to white. Such stories, gold finger, golden eye, the man with the golden gun, did you never stop to wonder where all this gold came from? Did you never stop to ask what was found in El Dorado? Well, let me tell you, not a nugget, not an ounce of ore, but light gilding the bay and perhaps bananas and perhaps aki and such language as could summon wind to capsize Columbus's ships. And if that's not gold, 
than what is. But but I, I, I was thinking that place is such a complicated thing, mm. um, and it's multiple. It, it, it's kind of simultaneously happening. You know, there is there is the landscape, and and then place happens to it. We name it. We build monuments. We give a history, and place mm. uh, begins to happen. So though we all come from Jamaica. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we come from different Jamaicas, and probably you can Absolutely. just first talk about that, about what are the different Jamaicas that we come from. So mm. just briefly, what, what was your Jamaica, yeah. Nicole? Um, so my Jamaica, whew, good question. So I came from a small town, well, Kingston, really, Vineyard Town, and I was highly aware of the fact that, you know, we had, we had different Jamaicas um, when I passed my common entrance, um, you know, um, for St. Andrew High School for Girls, which you, you two are aware of, but this is this um, elite high school in Kingston, where that was where I first became um, aware of the class differences of Jamaica, so the, the, the different Jamaicas, because growing up in Vineyard Town, it was like, you know, this small enclave, like, um, it was more like, oh, well, you know, I had a great childhood. I was, you know, with neighbors who we had the same socioeconomic um, background. Our parents, you know, were going to work like at the Ministry of Health, you know, secretaries, or, you know, sometimes, you know, as um, probably like the cleaning lady or the helper. Um, until going to high school, that was when I started seeing, you know, an expansion of, you know, girls from different um, socioeconomic enclaves of the island. So you have the upper St. Andrew girls or the middle class girls. And that was really my first glimpse of the different Jamaicas. And then, of course, uh, my mother sometimes taking us to the countryside um, where my uncles um, live in St. Mary um, and seeing um, there's an even, um, you know, in terms of what's going on there in terms of the poverty. And my, my uncle, who was once a farmer, um, you know, losing his land, for example, and then seeing what happens there. Mm. But definitely the different Jamaicas, um, I started really thinking more about that in high school and then beyond in college. But mm. it was really fascinating to know that we do have different stories. Mm. I mean, mm. you know, that, that is true for every place, yeah. by mm. the way, and it's, it's, it's just fascinating. Yeah, again, just how yeah. place is multiple and simultaneous. So, mm -hmm. What was your Jamaica, Marlon? I was always traveling too. Oh. Um, you know, we... You know, we, we grew up in, I remember um, the first time I, I was aware of a different Jamaica is when my father, my father became a lawyer and he created this sensation. He won five cases in one week. Mm. So everybody was trying to get this guy. And I remember, I remember the, the, the first time I knew there was a different Jamaica was when this sort of panel of lawyers came to our house in Portmore. And Portmore is a, a, a working class neighborhood mm -hmm. mostly. And, um, and it was a discussion about you now need to graduate to a different Jamaica. So first you need to divorce your black wife, divorce the Darcy wife, get new children, and so on. A better quality of children. A better quality, <laughs> because I remember my, and the thing is, I remember to go to this other Jamaica. And I remember because my boss, when my first boss in advertising did that to the point of naming his new children the same names. Wow. Um, wow. That's nothing to do with Jamaica, it's everything to do with him being an <laughs> <Yes>. asshole. <laughs> um, but, it's, it's, but then I also lived in Portmore, but went to school in Kingston, and I went to a really posh school. We both went to the same school, Wilmer's Boys School. We should tell you everything. You know? It's, it's but older than America. It is older than America. It really is. <laughs> it's a good, what, 50, yeah. a good 30 years older than America. Yeah. My but I remember even, even then the sort of code switching mm. Mm -hmm. where I'm sort of, an, you know, I got to uptown school, mm -hmm. but I live in, in, in Portmore. And, what, and the, the thing that made me realize it was two different Jamaicans is when I came across people who never do, knew the other, other part. So I remember the first time I took my friend who lives in, up in, in like Hope Pastors, I took him downtown. <laughs> And it's like, you know, I think he thought he was going to get mugged because he was in Bronx. <clears throat> he has never been there. He's just never been below a certain border in, in Jamaica. Right. So I thought code switching, traversing was what was normal. Right. It's from them I learned that it was two different Jamaicas. Okay. And then, I, of course, I went to a whole bunch of others. Yeah. yeah. That, that's fascinating. I, I, I thought you were just kind of throwing shade purposely. I, I do come from Hope Pastures. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> And so, so perhaps I am the posh boy who, <laughs> and it never went downtown. 
Uh, <laughs> do, do you know, actually, I, we did go to the same high school, but yeah. do, do you know what we used to say at, say at Wilmers? We used to say, how do you keep the mosquitoes out of a Portmore house? Right. You lock the gate. <laughs> They, they really were that big. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. But you know what? Class was really important um, because, you know, I felt a little schizophrenic going from Vineyard Town to St. Andrew High. And my, my, my young brother, who's two years younger than me, actually went to Woolmers. Um, and, you know, he also had that same issue as well, coming home to Vineyard Town, but then going back to school the next morning to this very, quote-unquote, posh um, seen um, and you know it's interesting too because one thing is that I never told my friends where I lived my classmates didn't had no idea I'm from Vineyard Town so one th one thing I actually said this um, on stage yesterday uh, when I was talking to um, Elizabeth Walcott and Edwidge Nanticat where there's also a performance so for me coming from Vineyard Town to the school like St. Andrew High School I had to perform so sitting right here in the middle of these two gentlemen mm. and my legs are crossed and where I wear my dresses or my hair that was actually from St. Andrew High School saying well you know as a darker skinned black girl um, from working class Kingston you have to present in order to be acceptable to the upper class um, Jamaicans who I've encountered there. In fact, I, I, I was so good at it that I was like one of the stushest girls in the school. Um, and also, I, by virtue of that, I also lost my, my ability to switch in and out of patois. Um, and you know, that was one of my biggest regrets, but that was actually where I began to condition my mind to present myself in a way where I would be acceptable. Like, oh yeah, you could, you could definitely be at a party with you know, these upper class girls. Same in America, you could be at a party with all the white people. Mm -hmm. And you know, the black Americans do that here as well. You know, um, you know we, wear the, the, we wear the mask. And I really, mm -hmm. back in high school, I wore that mask well. Mm -hmm. And that was really something that um, it kind of seeped into my um, development into a, a young woman. Mm -hmm. um, and so now as a writer, somehow I'm trying to unpack that because that, what, that, what, what happened then actually was so much, so much internalized hate. And you hear me read this short excerpt with Dolores, and that was really our post-colonial scars coming out in that mother's, um, her advice to her young daughter. Mm -hmm. Nobody loves a black girl, not even herself. So I didn't love myself until now, as a young black woman, really coming into myself saying, no, I'm gonna actually speak to all those things that was said to me growing mm -hmm. up. Like, you're not good enough, your hair is not good enough, your skin is not good enough. And so, yes, these high schools, although we, we speak so lovingly of them, they kind of destroy, well, let me speak for myself, mm. it kind of des destroyed a part of my full identity, which mm -hmm. I'm trying to reclaim. Yeah, yeah mm. but also, I also think with, with the different Jamaicas is that I've also experienced people who come to Jamaica to, to find a certain one. Right. Like, um, there's this book that came out years ago called The Dead Yard by his writer Ian, Ian Thompson. Ian Thompson, yeah. And, and Ian, Ian came looking for two Jamaicas in specific. Mm -hmm. He came looking for this sort of, you know, retired and decadent planter class, like he's looking for his own William Faulkner novel. Mm -hmm. And he came also looking for a kind of, uh, a certain kind of ghetto as defined by old British immigrants to Jamaica. So he was always mystified by a black middle class. Yeah. Uh -uh. And, and it's not in the book. Uh -uh. And, mm. and, yeah. and that's what I was going to say that, I mean, you know, Jamaica's class structure is, I mean, it, it is a brutal structure. And mm -hmm. I think it is a, it's a very damaging structure, which I have always wanted to write against. Mm. Um, but it's so complicated. So mean, mm -hmm. for me, I definitely grew up in what we'd call uptown Jamaica, but I'm aware that Uptown Jamaica itself is very, is very complicated. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so my neighbors, though we're living on the same street, mm -hmm. um, my, my Uptown Jamaica was intellectual Uptown Jamaica. Mm -hmm. It was that kind of generation post-independence who felt you had to work for the country, you had to mm -hmm. build nation, blah, blah, blah. You had to go to university. Whereas my neighbors were moneyed middle-class Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And it's a very different, mm -hmm. you know, it was different accents, different experiences that you do on the weekend, um, also different ideas of blackness, right. but mm -hmm. also probably the middle class Jamaica that defines a school like St. Andrew is, how should I say it? There are some things in Jamaica that defy expectations. Um, so for instance, color hierarchy. In, no one ever says this outright. In Jamaica, the color hierarchy is black, then white, then mixed. Mm -hmm. No one ever expects this. The mix is the highest right. that you can be in Jamaica. But mm -hmm. also, language in Jamaica moves uh, from 
if you're talking about linguistic theory, the kind of mm -hmm. basilic, the patois that some, that the lower class would speak. Uh, the most prestigious form of the language is what the middle class speaks, not the upper class. Mm -hmm. I think it's because the upper class needed to speak to the slaves. Uh, <laughs> but therefore, there's this kind of affectation of not speaking patois, mm -hmm. not, mm -hmm. not using the Creole, which is not an uptown thing. It's a middle class thing. Mm -hmm. It's the middle class who are insisting on that because we are the ones who are kind of striving. And so, yeah, know, it's yeah. Uh, respectability. But and it's the it's this middle class that had the biggest problems with me writing so much in Patois. Exactly. I remember someone saying, "Aren't you an English teacher? Mm. Uh, why are you writing in, in in the idea of language being broken? Is a very middle class value. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, a, a very, a very yeah. problematic right. idea of this yeah. language that is whole oh, and okay. wonderful right. being mm -hmm. broken, broken English. Yeah. 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 I mean, even recently, I was, I was um, talking on Facebook about um, Patois language systems and, and that Jamaican Patois shares a lot with Wolof in that we don't, that our verbs stay present tense. Yes. Mm -hmm. We don't say he went, we say mm -hmm. him did go. Right. Yeah. You know, you soon go, yeah. go, go. The present tense stay, the, the verb stays present tense, mm -hmm. which we think is really, really inferior English. Right. When it's actually just how a lot of African languages conjugate. Oh yeah, I mean it. It, it, yeah. is, it is almost Yoruban in its structure. Mm -hmm. do, do, right. do, do you want me to break down some of this language situation? It's going to sound very. Uh, yeah. You see, in Jamaica, there's in a country like Haiti, you could move between French and Creole, and they would call that a diglossic society. It's just two languages. You either speak French or you speak Creole. No, no movement. Mm. In Jamaica, I could tell you a sentence which I'm, I think many of you would not get. I could say. Uh, which do many of you understand? Wait, I want somebody to translate. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I am not going down there. I'm not, I'm not. But right. you see, in Jamaica, we could go, you, we could go every spot along the spectrum and this mm -hmm. would be correct. We could go, I am not going down there, I am not going down there, me not going down there, me not going down there, me not go down there, me not go, me not go down there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And every single spot along that spectrum is right, and so we can move that full range. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so what I was saying before is that the, uh, the working class would say, mm -hmm. um, the middle class, would, the upper class would say something in between, I'm not going down there. And it's only the middle class would say, I am not going down there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so literature in the Caribbean, in Jamaica, is, is a very complicated thing because we're writing all along that spectrum mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. finding what is the appropriate place to write mm -hmm. and when do we suddenly start writing out of respectability? Uh, you know, when do people start frowning? Yeah. And uh, that's, yeah. Sorry, I keep jumping. No, go on. No, but that's the tricky part is with, with writing um, uh, a, novel, a Jamaican novel. Um, and that's one of the things I surrendered with the last book. I just yeah. want all the different kinds of Jamaican. There's a character in here who says, I, one thing I can't stand is when Jamaicans chat bad. <laughs> and we all have that obsession, everybody else chat bad. Mm -hmm. uh, because of this sort of standard which doesn't, doesn't, even, um, do, doesn't even exist. But there is always, and it's, it's tricky when you're trying to write. Um, yeah. I remember reading a book by a Jamaican writer that shall remain nameless. And you know, and I mean, these are people from country, and it was like, you know, it was like, Sharon, have you gathered all the boxes for us to go on the trip? <laughs> kind of know who that is. <laughs> I mean, like, I would have ask her like that. You know, it's like, and and it's, it's again aspirational because this is a very middle class right. yeah. uh, person, and um, and that's actually one of the things I'm interested in is the huge identity crisis of being middle class. Yes. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. because you you're know, not really Jamaican if you, mm -hmm. if you are in a strange way. Right. I mean, how did you give yourself that freedom, Nicole, I, um, to write all of the spectrum of that language? Yeah, I, oh. so first of all, I'm, I was, I'm, well, Here Comes the Sun really follows on as a three women, three working class Jamaican women, right? Dolores Tandy, Dolores, who you just heard in the monologue, who's a mother, Tandy, her young daughter, 15 years old, who's going to this elite high school and like myself had to go back and forth. So with, that, with Tandy's character, you'd find that she also struggles with that middle class affliction. Like she, she would not speak Patwa in public, you know, or even mm -hmm. to her own mother. Um, and then of course there's Margot who works at the front desk at the hotel where she has to greet visitors and she also has to, you know, speak in a certain way at the 
hotel, but then when she's speaking to another Jamaican, it shifts. And I wanted to actually show that, um, that, that shift that happens between Jamaicans when we're speaking to each other and then when we're, mm -hmm. when we're speaking to others, or if we're speaking to other Jamaicans of a different class. So, you know, we do it, but we don't really think about it that much. Mm -hmm. But um, I, you know, I've always been married to the fact that language is a huge part of identity, and I'll say this over and over again, as James Baldwin has said as well. And um, when I was writing as a new writer coming into the game, I really wanted to maintain authenticity. You know, I knew that if I was writing a story about Jamaicans and they were speaking to each other unobserved, they wouldn't be speaking in that standard English, like, oh yes, you know, fetch the water for me, please. They would not have been, they, some, wouldn't, some they wouldn't be doing something like that. You know, that would be, you know, people would throw the book across the room, right? And so I knew that I had to, I had to have an air, I had to really hear my characters, I wanted to hear them. And you know, I get this all the time when um, people would ask me in the Q&As, you know, what was the risk? I didn't, I didn't feel like I, I took a risk because really from writers who are not Jamaicans as well, you know, forcing people to slow down, you know, um, mm. just to see the characters, to hear them, right? Not writing to them, but just knowing that, well, I'm writing about my people. I want people, others and Jamaicans mm. themselves, Jamaicans to see mm. themselves on the page and others to actually see Jamaicans because we're virtually unseen usually. Yeah. Um, but would, so. you, you, would you use that language? I mean, I, I, think I'm, I think I agree mostly with you, except I... I always pause at the idea of the authentic mm -hmm. because I think I am, I am absolutely not interested in being authentic on the page. I want to appear authentic um, mm -hmm. and I want to fool you into thinking that I am being authentic. And if I mm -hmm. can straddle that ground where the Jamaican reader thinks, oh my God, that's me on the page, mm -hmm. but someone else can follow it, then I've achieved mm -hmm. something. But to do that, I've made all kinds of compromises yeah. and I've yeah. done away with authenticity. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so it's a game that you play as the writer to do that. I'm, right. I'm not interested in being a sociolinguist. Um, it, it's how you make the, that language literary. Writing true literary. to the character. Writing true to the character. Yeah, well, yeah but I think even, even with, with trying to write true to the character, I do play a game. Yeah. I, do, I had to hit a compromise. Um, one of the compromises is that is I, do, I don't write, I don't, more, for the most part, I don't spell pa, write patois phonetically. Right, yeah. That's like, you know, we can't do it. Well, if I write C-Y-A-A-N, everybody's going to go, what's a say, huh? <laughs> you know, it's, and, and, and also, I, um, you know, it's, 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 I still, I think I, I think I, I still sort of reserve, reserve the right to invent. Yeah. And even when I'm writing fiction about wherever, I'm, you know, there's still, the, there's still a sense of invention. Yeah. I also think, this is one of the reasons why I always have very mixed feelings about the whole idea of we need to do, we need to have a standard patwa. No. You know, or, or so on, or, or it's, it's, it's because it is, it is, it, it, it's, it's, it is um, super fluid and it is, and, and I still sort of reserve the right to sort of compose, um, you know, in a way with, with, um, with this language. So Marlon, I remember when we, so before I came on the scene, I remember mm. we had a conversation mm -hmm. um, at Negril, and I remember you t told me, you know, if you're going to be a writer, a serious writer as well, you know, your books are going to be translated, mm -hmm. and you know, writing in a way where it can be translated. So mm -hmm. I actually understand what you were saying just now in, in terms of that game you play, you mm -hmm. instead of spelling C-Y-A-A-N, mm -hmm. can't, you know, and um, just because, you know, yes, our books are being translated in different languages, mm -hmm. different people are reading it, and so those translators just to make it easier for them. Yeah, I think it's, but also, I actually think sometimes going into whatever that standard English is actually sometimes makes it clearer. Because I think, um, for example, if I, if I write, you know, bomba clap, pussy clap, rass clap, with C-L-A-A-T, those are bad words, people. <laughs> yeah. I, I just flinched. Hey, we get, no, yeah. <laughs> I'm so, we get, we get, yeah, we get that it's an expletive. Right. And so on. But when I was writing my second novel, which is most, it was about women and right. using those words, um, then people started asking, why are all the expletives tied to female body function? Mm. You know, which they wouldn't right. have gotten otherwise. So I yeah. think it's always, it's no hard and fast, it's always a, a, yeah. a navigation and a yeah. game that you play and you have to play it. Right. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, and, and there's so many politics that go back and forth. I mean, mm. Part of it for me is, uh, I, I guess also respecting how someone would visualize the word. I mean, me speaking in my standard way of speaking, I would naturally say something like, um, yeah, look at that little, little boy. Um, 
because I've said look at that little boy does not mean that I imagine that the word that is spelled D-A-T or that the word little is spelled L-I-C-K-L-E. Just like I think some Americans would say, oh my God, look at that little boy. I don't think they imagine in their head that the word is spelled L-I-D-D-L-E. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I will, not, I will mm -hmm. not do that to my character to spell mm -hmm. it phonetically, even though they pronounce it in mm -hmm. odd ways. And I think mm -hmm. that's just about being respectful to how we imagine the words mm -hmm. um, that, that we say. Uh, let me move this in, in, in a strange place, and I, and, and I don't know where I'm going with this. Uh, <laughs> There is something that obviously has to be acknowledged if the three of us are on stage together. Um, one is this, what's, uh, I guess some people say that there's this renaissance happening in Jamaican literature, Caribbean literature. Um, but Jamaica is, has been known, sometimes fairly, sometimes un unfairly, as a pretty homophobic country. Um, and we certainly all on this panel are all non-heterosexual. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And, and, we, and we've never been together to talk about that, to talk mm -hmm. about this new wave yeah. of Jamaican literature mm -hmm. coming from writers who at some point might not have been embraced mm -hmm. or might still not be embraced. What, mm -hmm. does, what does that mean for you, that risk to be representing Jamaica mm -hmm. uh, in some ways uh, from a country that doesn't necessarily always want to be represented by you. Yeah, right. that's, that's man, that's tricky. Lot, yeah. Sometimes I have to remember. Sometimes <laughs> I have to remember um, um, one of uh, one of Edwidge Antigat's essays in creating creating dangerously about how you, the char the characters aren't there to represent hated or represent themselves. Mm -hmm. And I, sometimes I have to re you know remember that. But there are times when I do get on this sort of yeah I'm out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like. You know, what about you know the, the Jamaican queer writers like people? When I decided to come out, I came out to the New York Times and blah blah <laughs> and so on. But it's it's um, but I still, I don't know. I still I still have a huge sense of nervousness and fear. We we're talking about this yesterday that I am part of the last part of an old generation who have no pleasant memories of queerness. Yeah, he old. Me old. <laughs> So when I hear even you and other people talk, I remember when I went back, I went back to Jamaica a couple of years ago and I met a queer students association at the college and I had my it gets better speech ready <laughs> because that's it. I come from the, we're gonna, you know, the, the, that generation and I'm ready to give this speech and they're like, we don't want to hear that. It's like, uh -huh. do you know Beyonce? Uh -uh. <laughs> uh -uh. Uh -uh. And it was the most wonderfully, and in the best sense of the word, shallow discussion. <laughs> That's very interesting. And they're like, you know, who's gay? Who's gay? Who's gay? Yeah. And so on. And, as I, I, and I, 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 I was so floored by it. And I was also sort of sad that I'm floored by it. Yeah. Because I still came, I, I was like, I also, I'm not the first to the new, I'm the last of the old. And the, the, surrounded by these students who absolutely refuse to give up the right to sort of move sloppily to adulthood. Yeah. Uh, blew my mind. Yeah, because we talked about this, because there mm -hmm. is something about when that article came out in the New York. I, I, mm -hmm. I think I realized then this huge difference that I, I, I didn't recognize that Jamaica. Because, right. Because for me, Jamaica was, I mean, it was always hard, but even now I feel <coughs> most comfortably <coughs> queer in Jamaica. You see, in any other landscape, I have to translate my queerness. I have to go, go to some club. I was telling them last night, you have to go... Do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking, I'm, I'm not queer in that way. Where's the soca music? Where's the... Right. Uh, but there's but a huge the elephant reggae? in the room, though. There's, a, there's yeah. an elephant in the room, and I'm going to be the one to bring up class yeah. all the time mm -hmm. because, you know, I am a part of the queerness where I was not out in Jamaica. You know, I came out to myself, but I thought it was more appropriate to come out in college when I came here to America. Um, I did that for one reason. I felt like I was like, you know, probably the only lesbian in the country. But when I actually started, yeah, when I started discovering that there were, um, there was a small group of lesbians and gay men on the island, that was actually when I started going back home for Christmas breaks and I'll go to the parties in Red Hills, mm -hmm. tucked up far up in the hills. Um, but you 
know what? If you're not a from a certain, if you're not in the inn, like, you know, in terms of access to certain things, you wouldn't know what's going on. So, you know, in terms of the working class gay Jamaicans who have no access, you know, they don't have any, um, anybody, um, any group to, to run to. <coughs> you know, I was lucky in that, mm. you know, when I went off to college, I actually became a part of an in crowd um, where it was kind of, you know, well, you know, we knew where the party was at. We knew, you know, who to talk to in terms of, you know, going to certain, you know, gatherings. Mm -hmm. But for the great majority of gay Jamaicans, that, let's say living in Vinera Town or let's say living in um, Denham Town, who, you know, living in households where people can look over the fence and see who's coming in and out of that person's house. Right. You know, you don't have a mm -hmm. sense of privacy. And also you don't have agency. So let's say somebody made a mistake and outed you on the job. That's it. You lost your job. You, lost, yeah. you lose your reputation. Yeah. Whereas uptown Jamaicans who are gay or lesbians, we, th th um, there's, you know, the gated communities that you live in. So right. there's that's protection there. And then also as a job, you're probably more likely to be the director of the, of the company right. or the CEO. So you also still have leverage. You still right. have a lot of power. And uh -huh. so, you know, for me, even writing it, Here Comes the Sun, Mar Margot, my main character, who is a lesbian, she wouldn't call herself that. But she's, um, she wouldn't be on a UE campus saying, oh, Beyonce, she'd be like, oh, I'm, I'm going to be in the closet for my own survival. Because if people find mm -hmm. out that I'm gay, I could be raped, right? If it was a man, it could be, it could be beaten. And um, yeah, I'm not going to ignore the fact that, that that still happens yeah. in the country. But yeah. also, I love the fact now that the, with the younger generation of Jamaicans who are finding that, that group, but they have yeah. to still do it in a nice little, com in a nice little um, yeah. um, community yeah. of safe space, really. Yeah. And and hasn't there always, and I want to leave space for at least five minutes even for two questions, yeah. but there, I mean, there, there are two weird things, I guess, kind of navigating mm -hmm. this, this global space. <clears throat> and for me, that, that weirdness, the other weird elephant in the room that we don't want to talk about is that a lot of advocacy for me, <clears throat> which has rightly noted just how problematic and awful homophobia can be in Jamaica, mm -hmm. I still recognize how easily Celebrate story that is, mm -hmm. and it is the story of the savage. Yeah, and it is a story that is so that is, that yeah. is taken in so easily that oh my God, let's wave a finger at those bad mm. black Jamaicans who yeah. are savages. Mm -hmm. And I never wanted to be a part of that. Right. And mm -hmm. so I didn't know how to navigate both saying my God, this is awful, but mm. not feeding how easy yeah. it is to wave yeah, a finger at them. And I ran yeah. I, I, and of course I ran into that yeah. after that New York Times article. Yeah. I remember when I w when I went to Booker. Daily Mail sent a team to Jamaica the very next day. They wanted to dig up the dirt and all the beatings I got in Jamaica. Uh -oh. all the, all, they wanted to find out where is this anti-gay Gestapo that forced me, forced me to, to the States. Yeah. And when they couldn't find anybody, they killed the story and then trashed the book because it's the Daily mm -hmm. Mail. Um, but they, 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 when, when, when they're trying to find that narrative, when I said things like, when I said in the, in the essay, I feel I had to leave either in a plane or in a coffin, mm -hmm. I go, oh, well, who were the anti-gay people charging after you? Yeah. And I go, you mean Bible scripture? <laughs> Yes. It, was, it wasn't that. It was not at all. And, it's, um, and it was never that, which is not to decry, not to, to deny what was going on. But it's, 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 um, Jamaica has always been complicated where it has been written yeah. and so on. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, it's, I didn't sit down waiting for this time where some brutal violence, such as, and then people who are so electrified by that narrative. Yeah. It's uh, the same thing. It's the sort of, how can we tie this back to a certain yeah. kind of savagery? I, mean, yeah. I will, yeah. I, I, don't, you don't have to answer it now, answer it now, because we're running out of time, but I'll just put it out there. But I did want to know if there is any part of artistic, uh, Productivity that comes out of that tension in all of us, or am I romanticizing it a little? But we mm -hmm. can think about. But I do want to open it up, yeah. even for five minutes, for two questions uh, from the audience. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for listening, by the yeah, way. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for that wonderful discussion. I come from pre. I was raised in both pre- and post-independent Jamaica. Mm -hmm. oh. And I don't really know your world, I'm not gay. <laughs> um, and I do know that Jamaica is a complex, both a complex and a wonderful um, society. Mm -hmm. So as, a, as an author myself, I wanted to ask you, how do you navigate through using some form of patois in your, in your novel mm -hmm. and 
getting your novel edited because I've had pushback from my mm -hmm. editors when I try to use patois. Is there? Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, because I have, a, I mean, I have an American publisher and an American editor and, and so on. What I have found is, well, for me, it's not, my, my, my problem with them is not necessarily a, res, a resistance to, to Pato. In fact, it was one, I remember, what, I remember it was um, an editor who had to school me when I said, should we put a glossary? And he says, no, if you put a glossary, then you're, gonna, you're, you're, you're joining the exoticization of your own vo voice. Yeah. And he says, no, don't put a glossary, let them read it. Well, Juno Diaz does not translate the Spanish. Right. Um, yeah. What I do find, though, is that I still have to be edit editor with an editor because they will come across a grammatical error and think, oh, that must be Jamaican. I say, no, it's a grammatical <laughs> error. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's um, even with the most, the most um, in tune editor, I still have to go back and be extra yeah. vigilant. Yeah. In August town, they changed, and I put it in quotes. So if you read the book now, they, you'd wonder why this is in quotes. It says, they went to see the, and I wrote, film show. And my editor just thought he clearly made a mistake and changed it back to film. I was so upset. <laughs> uh, but, you know, but I think, again, this is when we talk about the tradition. Um, and I think people like uh, you know, Lonely Londoners, Sam Selvan, offer so many just kind of good examples of this is how you write lyrically, how you show the Creole happening on the page, but in a way that embraces everyone. Um, you know, I mean, some people will have problems with what he's doing now, but it's just mm -hmm. a good example, and they're really good writings. Weirdly, especially out of Trinidad, that shows, that for me, taught me as a Jamaican how to write Creole on the page, and I thought that was, that was really useful. Mm -hmm. And find an agent um, who really respects your work, respects you as well. Um, I was lucky to find an agent who knew what I was trying to do with my work, knew the dialect had to be intact, you know, from writing about Jamaican characters, and she sold the book, she was in love with it. And I was lucky enough to get a publisher, an editor in the, my publishing house who also was in love with it as well. Mm -hmm. And so ha having people around you who actually respect what you're doing, mm -hmm. right, and th that you'll definitely um, be okay with that. Because I have run across a publisher. My, um, my second novel, I sent it to a publisher that shall remain nameless, Viking. Um, <laughs> And they sent me back a letter saying, you know, this is really, really brilliant. It's really, really good. But if, if, if it has any chance of, 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 of selling in the UK and the rest of the world, and they love saying that, the UK and the rest yeah. of the world, yeah. um, would you consider rewriting it in Queen's English? <laughs> and I said, so you want me to turn my novel into a Jane Austen novel with slaves, basically? <laughs> and of course, I end up not publishing with Viking. Um, because I was like, no, I said, well, I, I, my response to her was, no wonder Huckleberry Finn is an American novel. Um, so I did, there is that. There is, there, there, there are, there's still, I mean, I hope not anymore, because that was 10 years ago. But there was still some, in some places, that resistance. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right. actually, just Good. a couple of years ago, a very short story, I had an, a, a previous agent who actually said, oh, you know, right, it's that Midwestern American women can actually understand it. And I think he was really, you know, that was really ignorant for him to say, but, mm. you know, that you, you'd get that. But like I say, the person who's in love with your work, you, can, you mm. can't go wrong. Yeah. We yeah. probably only have time for one last question. But again, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, uh, you talked about the different uh, hierarchies in Jamaica in terms of economics and uh, language and sexuality, and I wanted to hear some about gender. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, so for me, I know that I want, as a writer, I had a responsibility. Um, I wanted to write about the women um, who I grew up with, right? These are working class Jamaican women who are, you know, um, like I said yesterday on the panel, often marginalized and silenced. Um, so we, yes, we hear the story about homophobia, homosexuality, homophobia. Yes, we hear those stories are violence, but how about violence against women, right? Mm -hmm. Sexual violence as well. And I really wanted to bring that to the forefront because we were raised in a culture where we're taught to be silent, taught not to wash our dirty clothes in public river, right? Taught shame to respect shame more than anything else. And growing up with that, seeing, you know, my parents, my mother, my aunts, my, you know, even, you know, girls I grew up with, keep this with them, keep this shame, because they're like, oh, they don't want to, um, to disgrace the family. 
I wanted to, as an artist, explore that more and actually write our stories so that we can actually have a conversation, a dialogue. Because I do believe that dialogue bring, brings change, change really. And mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to um, be published in a year when we had that tam the tambourine army. And women are now reaching out to me, Jamaican women reaching out to me saying thank you for sharing our stories, right? The sexualization of our young girls. And mm -hmm. I think we're going to still, uh, hopefully we move forward with that because for a long time, Yes, working class Jamaican women, and Jamaican women as a whole, have been shoved to the margins. Mm -hmm. so. Anything mm -hmm. else to say to that? No, I was, I, I, absolutely, I agree, I agree with all of that. I also think, though, that it's, even in, when it comes to questions of gender, you can't escape class. When you're talking, uh, talking about Jamaica, it just filters into mm -hmm. everything. The, the, even, in, in, even in the ways in, in which, um, you know, women interact with each other, the values or so on, the way in which class is used as a separated thing. Which is funny because, I mean, we, you know, when I'm in America, I talk about race more, but it does, it just something that it, it, it's still, it's still oh, at the core, the core divider is still, oh. you know, is still that. And I think that's also something that, that um, still eludes me when I'm writing, I'm still trying to figure it out. Yeah. But ultimately, I think when we're writing about Jamaica, ultimately that's what we're going to end up seeing. You're always around. writing through class yeah. and everything. Yeah. Um, thank you, everyone, for um, listening. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> uh, and yeah. <laughs>